<laughs> uh, what's up, uh, man? Cool. I think. Oh man, it's so good to finally like chat and meet face to face. I know, so, so right? Good. Like 2023 version of meeting face to face, like through a computer. <laughs> I know, but one day, one day, and it just seems that you're heading to London when I think we're going to just meet, but then I'm heading to America at the same time. Right. So it's, um, yeah, it's like, yeah, I, th I think we're going to overlap. So if you can get yourself to London, I'd love to see you guys in person. Yeah, I think I will be here. I've got some, um, I've got a few little meetings and a few friends that I'm doing the week, the few days before that you're here. So I okay. think I'll be here anyway. So it could be perfect. Well, this is cool. So this is officially the least prepared I'm, I am that I've ever been for doing a podcast and uh, for, very sporadic, very last minute. But uh, for people listening, uh, Jay and I uh, talk quite a bit via social media, WhatsApp, and uh, we've connected through originally through through Twitter. Um, my friend Jay over here is a professional bassist, professional studio musician, I guess we could say. Right. And uh a, yeah. an accomplished uh, up and coming visual artist as well. And we, we chat quite a bit about like music and art topics and just life in general. And I thought both of us thought, Hey, this would be nice just to uh, kind of, you know, plant a uh, fly on the wall, so to say, and have a conversation about life and music and art and just see where it goes. And rather than uh, texting back and forth on this beautiful Saturday, why not record it? So here we are. Absolutely. It's perfect. So, I mean, yeah. I was going to say, if you want to give me like your, uh, what's your elevator pitch when, when someone meets you and they're like, what do you do for a living? What, what's your answer nowadays? It's so interesting. I feel like it kind of depends where I am. Um, I mean, I, for the last 10 years, I've worked as a musician. So my elevator pitch usually ends up with, you know, I'm a musician and I do this and, I, you know, and if it depends where I am. If I'm in a networking event with a load of musicians and I can, you know, I talk a bit about things more in detail. And then again, if I'm doing teaching and I'm talking to parents, I probably leave off the musician part and I leave off the art part. And Web3 is a whole new board game. So mm. if I'm meeting someone just out in the wild um, and I, I might mention that, yeah, I'm doing like a lot of art in Web3 and it's going really well. And then if the question is what's Web3, then, then I have to have a whole different conversation there. So, um, yeah, elevator pitch in general. So the last 10 years, I've worked as a professional musician. So that is um, mainly as a bass player. I studied bass in London and I did a degree in music, which is where I met my beautiful fiance, Emily Fay, who is a songwriter. She was doing a songwriting degree there at the time. And that was about nine years ago now. So um, longer for the degree, nine years ago since we've been together. So that's kind of a little start of the career. And I've been lucky to, you know, um, play festivals and gigs and tour and and have a just a wild little wonderful music career um so that's the, and, and i still do that now as my my irl job my main job um but for the past 18 months i'd say my kind of my primary focus has been web3 and my visual art so i've been doing that every day probably longer than 18 months but 18 months since i've been in web3 and yeah that's been wild everything from exhibits in the uk and us and europe and asia and all around the world really and um you know speaking to time as part of their emerging artist series uh it all a big kicked off when mark cuban kind of shared my work to his nine million followers and just collaborating with incredible artists and and then even like even my work my music career has kind of been improved by web3 having sia like select a song i did like a remix of her song unstoppable which she gave stems out to so i mean this is hours of conversation just in in that but like web3 is unbelievable right? so i'd really like to see your kind of views on how you find web3 at the moment i would love to talk about that too but before we do i would like to take a step back because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to lose i don't want to lose people right away in the conversation because only a certain percentage of people listening know about or care about web3 so we will definitely get there but I want to talk about like the music and the art and the journey and, and that sort of thing. And it, I think we'll start out by saying it's when we first connected, I found it so like, I don't know if ironic is the word, probably not. It's kind of like a, that Alanis Morissette song where she uses ironic the wrong way throughout half the song. But in any case, you know, you're Jay, I'm Jay. I live in New Jersey. You live in Jersey in the UK. Journey is, what's the official name? Jersey Islands? Jer 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 what's um it's just Jersey. Jersey <laughs> We've though. always called it Jersey. Two, two Jersey like, have New you Jersey know. and then Jersey. Two, um, uh, yeah, I guess it would be. Um, sorry, I'm talking two, about two, sh two shaggy haired, bearded Jays from Jersey 
um, connecting. <laughs> and I, and uh, so that was kind of funny. And then also, I think it's really kind of cool that you're a professional musician that's like kind of emerging and really interested in art. And I am a professional artist that's, as you know, really spending a lot more time on my music nowadays. So it's like we're from other sides of the pond, other sides of like our creative journeys, doing the exact flip flop opposite. And um, so that's that's kind of cool. And I, I really before we get into the Web3 stuff, which we definitely will do, I want to talk about the music. So that's really what I find fascinating um, initially about meeting you because you had um, I think it's important to kind of dive in a little bit and talk about some of the things you've done with music is really cool. I know you've done some stuff with some of the guys from Dispatch, like you, you already name dropped a little bit. Like, I think people listening in would, would get a kick out of kind of hearing how you went from being like just a music teacher and like gigging to getting bigger, let's say, achievements in music. That's from the musicians listening. I think people would enjoy hearing that. How does that happen? And what have you done? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, I, definitely, definitely. So yeah, let's go back a bit to um, to the beginning. So I really coming from Jersey, which is such a small island. For anyone who doesn't know, it's a nine by five um, mile island. So really small in the Channel Islands, which is b between England and France. And growing up there, um, like so many sort of small town places, small island communities. The music scene was was amazing you know i started in bands and i and i did what everyone does and 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 just was picked up an instrument and just was really rubbish for ages and did battle the bands and and did it and music was just my passion and life growing up i mean it still is now but that's kind of how i you know you grow up and there there isn't particularly any universities or any further education in jersey so what people end up doing is moving out of the island usually to england but you know all over the world to you know do further studies so I did that. I went to London and I, um, and I studied bass guitar and it was unbelievable. So I have so many wonderful and incredible stories. One of which is how I found my, um, my band, my main band, which I'm still in now. It's, and th this band is called Lloyd Yates. The singer is, um, his name is Lloyd Yates and, um, he's like the lead songwriter, but we are really a band. We have been for 10 years. Uh, sorry, they've been going longer than I am. So this is a little, a, a lovely little story, actually. And when I was in London, I was starting out and I was looking for like all the opportunities. And I saw this advert on something called Gumtree. I guess it would be um, Craigslist kind of thing. And the advert was said, um, wanted best bass guitar player in London. So I thought, you know, I've got to apply for that. That's amazing. So I then list, that is then on the advert, it listed a load of bands. Um, that they were into and suddenly I was like well this is for me 100% and this will bring go back to where how we first met and how are we um, connected but they said we're into bands like John Butler Trio, Xavier Rudd, Dispatch and you know a whole host of bands which are just my favorite musicians so I applied straight away I got a message a few days later um, from the manager saying you know we're doing this you know I see that you've said you're from Jersey do you know that we're from Jersey so this was complete coincidence they had nothing on the advert of saying this and it turns out this is a band called Lloyd Yates they just moved over to London from Jersey and I had seen them growing up like the, the, the guys in the band are a little bit older than me like I think six or seven years older than me but I'd seen them kind of growing up watching them and doing so well I'd go to watch them play and I loved their music anyway so it was a no-brainer mm -hmm. so I got the audition and um i think i got the job just because i was from jersey really but um <laughs> they've become brothers um so that kind of was like i don't know about fate but if there's if, if fate's real then that proves it really it was just uh, meant to be so we were then lucky to kind of i joined the band and, and things were going really well we were very lucky to um to play some amazing gigs just all around the country really like tour for years and i know um we did some huge festivals and and it's just been amazing. We've had the best opportunities. Uh, 
and so that's kind of, I finished college and I still, I still play with Lloyd, like all the, from the years now, the pandemic was, it was hard for many musicians. So things have slowed down a little bit, but now the music industry is back, getting back to normal, you know, we're going to do a lot more original bands, but like I said, I'm, I, it's not just one band. I, I'm a bass player. They're quite sought after. So I'm in quite a few different projects and bands and depping and, and session work is, is my main form. But, um, Lloyd Yates is kind of my original band, which I, I, I owe so much to. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the start. What was, um, it, what was it about bass for you? Like for me, I kind of got into guitar first and I'm, I'm lousy at it, but I really love it. And then I recently got into bass, as you know, and I find it such a great instrument, but I think I overlooked it like a lot of people because bass is one of those instruments that's so important to music, but to the novice listener, a lot of times you can not even notice it consciously. It's almost one of those instruments you have to kind of seek out in order to really appreciate it, in my op opinion. And then once you discover yeah. it, you're kind of like, oh, wow, this is really sick. I love this instrument, the music. What was it about bass as opposed to another instrument for you? Oh, man, I live and breathe bass. <laughs> um, I really do. And for me, it was kind of a classic story where, you know, growing up, I had loads of friends into music. I didn't really start learning an instrument. I think I was about 12. Um, and... Uh, all my friends like we were in bands and wanted to do stuff and and some one of the just some close friends said look we need a bass player learn bass and it was just that little thing I was like kind of this is your job now but I loved it and I had a few older friends who had basses and then would teach me and does and I basically spent like the whole until up to university I was completely self-taught and I just I just I think that's what makes it a a real passionate musician where they find something that they love and they go and and do it at home and practicing and, and I was doing it every day for so long and as a teacher now I can see some of the students who who have that as well and and it's a real it's amazing I have, to, I have students now which are going off to university to study bass and I taught them since before they even picked up an instrument so that's so rewarding for me mm. um yeah so bass in general Oh, there's so many amazing things about it. Like you said, yeah, it's a little bit one of those instruments where it's so integral to the band, but in some situations you can almost not no notice it. And sometimes that's actually the what your job as a bass player is, really. It's like, it's not always to be the lead. It's not, all, there are obviously bands where bass is the lead. You know, Chili Peppers, for example, Flea is incredible. And, you know, he, he, he takes on a, a lead role in that band. But for many, you know, bands, I'd say the bass is, for me as a bass player, I, I prefer to to use the bass to to enhance the song. Um, mm. It's not always about me. I think if you if you like that as a drummer or a bass player or a rhythm guitar player, if you're trying to make it about you, it might be detrimental to the song. So often, as a bass player, I'm there just to do what I can to enhance the song. That's really interesting. I like that. Um, like, do you find a crossover? So you got into visual arts. I don't know how long ago. So let's maybe touch upon that. But I'm like curious how the creative connections in your brain or the universe, how that connects for you. I think one of the reasons that I love music so much and how it connects with me with my art is I paint quite often to music. And subconsciously, I'll find my brush as I'm painting or my Apple pencil while I'm drawing on my iPad, kind of connecting with often the, the bass or the drums or like the melody. And I'll find like my brain sort of subconsciously is following how the music kind of goes off and comes back and how the instruments connect with each other. And like, especially in jazz, I listen to a lot of jazz and I love how the music sort of goes off into tangents in places where you're like, where is this going? And then somehow they, they catch it and bring it back in. And I find that when I'm painting, it's a very similar energy where I'll especially during the early phases of a painting, I'll kind of go kind of very chaotic and crazy and find weird pathways. And then often I'll kind of paint right over it and it didn't actually achieve anything in the end result, but it did in the process of taking me to different places to see what works, if that makes any sense. And I'm wondering how music for you, your music brain, how it's hardwired, how that connects with your creative process when it comes to visual arts. Yeah, absolutely. I think we are very, very similar in that aspect. Um, for me, uh, visual art, I've, I've done art since I, I was quite young and um, I studied it at kind of college, like uh, A-level um, in the UK. But it's always been something I've done for me, mainly. It's something I, I would just, you know, I spent so much of my, most of my life 
devoted to my music career. Um, I've never pursued a professional career as an artist until fairly recently, um, mainly because my attention was just focused on music 100%. And the art side of things, I would just do that at home. I would paint all the time. I'd create things all the time, but they would be for me. They would be, they wouldn't be with an, any attention to sell them. It would just be something, but I would always do them, give them away or as gifts or, or anything like that. So that's kind of my starting as an artist. But I've always painted to music. I I do lots of mainly music just on it constantly. So it's just in me there. And yeah. over the last couple of years, I, what I would do is I would actually try and paint music. And I, it's interesting that you mentioned jazz. I, I listen to some jazz. Um, I've done a lot of studying jazz at, at college. I've got some friends I, they who live and breathe jazz. Um, I always find jazz a bit like abstract art in the sense that kind of jazz is one of those genres where you you have to be very good at your instrument in my opinion to yeah. be good at jazz i don't i don't think some people say oh you know anyone can play that it's just random experimental noises they can just do that but it's more it's more so the fact you're kind of they could play you know most songs because they're incredible musicians but they're breaking the rules and they're going against everything and they're, they're they're going outside of that you know diatonic um scale and and breaking things but they can do everything else. And in the same sense of abstract art is you, you hear often people say, even for my work, they'll say, you know, my, my 10 year old could do that. They're just throwing paint at a piece of wall. But I think it's more than that. You know, they they could paint these amazing pictures as well. And a lot of them do, but there's something different. I think abstract and jazz kind of have that, that same feeling together. Um, so I was, I, I would paint, I would try and paint um, sound and color and, and express myself um, i would paint scenes i would paint what the lyrics mean everything so i would actually make my pictures my abstract pictures kind of devoted to music i would pick out a song and try and paint through that song and see what comes out and then do it again and so yeah i've always had that interest and then also when i'm painting things which aren't abstract you know just a, a, a you know a scene or an animal or something you know i would paint to music also and similar to you i feel like my style kind of has that rhythmical sense to it it's it's like the brush is almost like like you said like i'm tapping to the music maybe that's coming out of my artwork for sure but yeah i feel like we're pretty similar in that aspect so interesting hearing you as a professional musician say you're, you're comparing jazz to abstract art i totally don't see that i see that as the exact opposite for me like I, the way mm. i interpret the way i interpret it is as you noted like to be a jazz musician you have to be so incredibly fluent that it's almost for me, it feels like you're almost like exploring uh, this cave and you're digging in the dark while you're being attacked by wild animals and you have to kind of find your way out of, the, of a jungle or something. And, and only the most skilled person can figure their way out of this maze. But I feel like you have to be so incredibly fluent and skilled in order to catch what the other musician is doing, at least in like improvised jazz. Obviously, there's jazz songs that are very worked out and refined but like listening to like improvised jazz i find that it's you have to be so like courageous and so willing to screw up and i find that antithetical to maybe abstract art in a sense like for me like i see like yoko ono singing as more like some some abstract art you know where it's kind of like just like mm -hmm. i'm just gonna express myself and i'm gonna oh like whatever like do my thing or um expressively or you know and i feel like jazz is like i don't know i, I feel like it's it, to compare it to a visual art i see it more towards like a um i don't know like a van gogh or a dali or like someone that bent the rules and did really weird strange things but was able to kind of solve eventually solve the problem does that make sense that's how i look at it but there's many ways to look at it yeah i, I kind of you've kind of talked me around a bit um so maybe like, tell, it's me, I'm, tell me i'm wrong tell, tell, convince me i'm wrong <laughs> well, i'm not saying you are wrong I, I mean i'm always open to changing my views depending on new information and that's some like a new perspective at least and i, I like it I, I don't know if you can hear the dog the dog's going crazy <laughs> it okay. might not be being picked up by by my um thing i might have to go and let her out to the toilet or something um but to, <laughs> to be back what the um to what you were saying yeah i wonder i wonder um it's more the expression like i think jazz like you said i feel jazz is for the elite musicians but i mean there are some jazz i've heard which are it's so out there it's so so out there where it's like wow i don't even know if i like that very much it's yeah. that out there it's kind of like i don't get it or sometimes or sometimes it's like you know that's just me 
picking random notes and playing in them weird rhythms you know i feel like anyone technically could do that but they couldn't at the same time and similar to abstract art i feel like you know you could some you could just throw a big piece of paint on, on and and smoosh it around and and then there you go anyone could physically do that but could they you know get the same results it's kind of that's more as what i was equating it to um you know just having to know a bit about art rather than um just just you know putting a, a squash of color on a canvas but who knows yeah hmm I'm gonna to have to agree to disagree on that one, but that's okay. <laughs> that's totally. <laughs> I'm okay. with that. I'm I think, like you know, yeah. you know what? Uh, when you describe that, I feel like uh, a lot of jam bands remind me of that. Like I, I, I like love, um, you know, some of the the Grateful Dead's like greatest hits type stuff. But I've seen the Grateful Dead when Jerry was still alive, and I've been to like Phil Lesh mm -hmm. and all those type of bands. Some of those performances feel to me like incredibly chaotic, and I'm like, what is going on? Nothing nothing makes mm -hmm. sense together one guitarist is playing one melody one's playing another one and i know all the deadheads and jam band people are going to hate me for saying this but some of it i'm just like what is going on here um yeah some strange stuff man but that, i guess that begs the question like is there is there a standard in the arts and does there have to be like i feel like people like us like if we were born hundreds of years ago right there would be a certain set of standards both as a musician and a visual artist there had to be like to say you were an artist or to say you were a musician or something like that, you would have to go through an apprenticeship or training. You would have to know theory. It was sort of like um, being a doctor. You'd have to know certain things. You'd have to know color theory. You'd have to know composition. You'd have to know music theory and, you know, triads and all kinds of stuff, right? You'd have to know circle of fifths. You'd have to know things in order to claim being an artist or a musician nowadays not at all like you said you could throw down notes but more so you could definitely just become an art like an artist we see that on twitter for sure like anyone is just doing whatever um like does there have to be standards like the fact that standards have eroded in my opinion is that a good thing or a bad thing like what's your thoughts on that it's interesting both i like the fact that anyone can kind of there's not as much as restrictions in terms of recording music you know like even take 20 30 years ago it's only the people with that were with money could really afford music now anyone can pretty much record it with with a phone in their pocket yeah. um whether that's led led to you know better music i don't know we you know we all seem to have this um feeling that all the greatest music was created 20 30 years ago plus you know 40 years ago 50 years ago um so I don't know with having people having more ability to create has created more music, but I do like that it's not restricted just by money. Um, in terms of, you know, anyone be able to create art, I think it's hard to say. I mean, art, art really essentially, it's an interesting topic. I mean, if, if someone loves that piece of art and, and is willing to pay money for it, then who's to say that it's not art? You know, depending however it was created, whether it's a, a you know a someone just lazily just you know putting a banana on a piece of paper and squishing it, or if it's yeah. um, it's something that's taken you know fifteen hours of dedicated art and and then you know to ten thousand hours to get there, it's hard to say. You know, I always for me personally, I love the process. I will love watching people you know create piece of art. I think a process is, is almost as important you know and i and i value people and you so sometimes you can see a piece of art and you can go wow that's that's dedication is taking them just to get to that that thing so that's me personally as an artist but there are pieces which you know are abstract and, and i don't know how long it's taken maybe they have, have taken five minutes and and they've just thrown it on and and they've been an artist for a month and and who knows but if i've kind of connected with that then it doesn't say it's not art doesn't say that it's not art true yeah i see your i see your i see all the points it's an interesting topic it's something i love to think about because i feel like i've spent my whole life pursuing my craft and then mm -hmm. i have a lot of mixed feelings on on the topic it's an interesting topic for me because I, I often wonder like like does it matter am i working too hard am i not working hard enough like it's it's very interesting um one of the qualities that i admire about you is something that I would imagine came from you being a teacher. I could be wrong. Maybe it was your upbringing with your parents. I don't know. But like, I, I find that you're very uh, collaborative, not only in the direct sense, but like you're very encouraging um, 
let's and I'll relate this to what we were talking about because we were talking we've been talking for a long time now about let's do a, a a piece together let's do a visual piece in NFTs art let's combine music and then you keep you keep you don't let you don't let up man you keep pushing me like <laughs> come on Jay do, you know do some music and like for me that needs to be de demystified because I like I've been playing my guitar on and off as a hobbyist for for decades I very much enjoy playing music I'm I'm learning. Also bass, I, I dabble in piano. I love the process. But when you tell me when we're chatting or talking on WhatsApp, you say, hey, come on, why don't you write a piece of music and send it to me? I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like it's like you're telling me to uh, solve like string theory. Like in my mind, like the idea of writing a piece of music that's actually a song or a musical mm -hmm. in any way seems so foreign to me, but I love the challenge of it. And I love how encouraging you are. And I, I bring that up because, well, first I wanted to pat you on the back and say, good job. Well done. But also <laughs> uh, it's interesting because a lot of people that um, really enjoy the visual arts, I'll meet them at an art show or they'll message me and they say, I love to paint. I love to draw, but I couldn't do this. Or I love, I wish I can do that. Or, and my, quite often my answer is very similar to yours. Like just, you know, just do it, you know, like it, no one's expecting it to be great. Just, just freaking do it. But then, and I don't understand why someone would love to draw or be creative in a visual sense and not just, just put stuff out, stuff out there and just, just create. Why don't you just, you know, but then I, I look at it, I turn the mirror around to myself when it comes to music, the idea of sharing anything with you, a professional musician, even though you're my friend terrifies me. <laughs> That's so, I mean, thank you very much for the lovely words. Um, I think this is going to, this little section is going to be perfect to cut to cut and then put next to the piece of music that we release this year <laughs> um so we're gonna do that and we're gonna have this and say you know I'm, I'm terrified of doing this and then cut to this like incredible art piece with music and it's gonna be yours and you're gonna feel very very proud of it um i think i like you said um some of the things i found i think and this is i mean just from years of experience and some people will say to me how do you get on stage in front of people? You know, like I, I couldn't do that. And some of these people I know are, are incredible musicians, you know, they've been, mm -hmm. you know, quote unquote bedroom musicians, but they are some of the best musicians that you'll know, but they just unfortunately suffer from anxiety and and stage fright and things. And I mean, I'm not a psychologist in, in music, but for me, I used to have stage fright for sure. And I found that the, and it's the unfortunate answer is the only way I got over it was to do it. <laughs> like, it would it would suck i would like be at university and like i and i wouldn't have maybe practiced quite as hard as i did it and then i would have to get up in front of my peers and judges and like you know play music and i would be like physically sick beforehand like so 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 bad and then i got over to the point and realized that no one cares if i make a mistake like no one cares if i don't play this note right or if i if i'm not looking here and they're all too worried about themselves and what they're doing and like after like a thousand gigs later i just get up and play now i mean i make mistakes all the time and and it's fine i mean i try if it's a, a mistake that i i recognize and go oh i need to not do that next time but i don't lose any sleep over them i just feel like i i guess life's a little bit too short not to um to, to put out you know work and your music and it's similar to what i did with art when i when i started this is so strange but it's literally the, exactly the reverse of you i yeah. I did. A, I, I created this collection of art, and I, I was like being in, in, around in, in a circle of musicians and friends. I was like, I am not ready to share this with them quite yet. I kind right. of made it anonymous. I made a, an account, and I didn't tell anyone I was doing it for months, you know. And um, some of them still don't even know I'm doing it now, um, two years later. But I, I did it, and I, and I, and it's been an incredible journey for sure. So, I think you'll be surprised how like receptive everyone is. And, and to be honest, the main thing you're doing it for should be you. Yeah. Like, no, no one cares. Like, man, I can't wait to see some of the stuff that we create. I'm, I'm going to do some recording later on. And that's my passion. I've, I mean, art is obviously my passion too, but music really has been my life. So I can't wait to, um, to, to work on some pieces with you. And even if it's a, something small start with something small even if it's like a, a guitar riff a bass riff that you've been doing anything you know I, i've got a little studio set up and can add drums and and everything and develop it and it doesn't have to be 
that's it as soon as you send it it's, it's out into the world we can develop it it can take months and, and then you find go and then eventually you go oh my god i'm so happy with this let's let's do something with it um i can't wait for the world to see your <laughs> music not giving up man i appreciate that <laughs> it's um not happening. Well, lordy lordy it's some a couple of things you said really hit me that i think a lot of people listening should try to re-listen to and really absorb one of the things you sort of said reminded me of that um, saying or quote. It was something like the only way past something is like straight through it. Um, I have no idea who originally said that, but it's a great uh, motto of life. And it's so true because you and I also have another thing in common. We both, we're both into surfing. We're both into the ocean. And um, I know for me, and I'm sure for you, uh, quite often the things that we love most are the things that at one time, if not still, scare the crap out of us right like so surfing is something is an example of that something i still have nerves if it's a, a day that's um beyond my comfort level um i got certified in scuba i believe i believe you did too right aren't you a scuba diver i did too yeah yeah yep. that, that was something that my dad did growing up and um he would always want me to do it and i was frozen in fear frozen and it wasn't until later on in life when i had the opportunity and i eventually got certified and it's still scares me i've had panic attacks underwater which is not a good experience when you're mm -hmm. scuba diving um no, but no. You know, pa painting live on stage is another example there's a lot of things like that that i think uh, people should um understand that that you and i who are professionals in our craft still experience that sort of thing and it's you sort of develop a uh a, a, not a comfort but sort of a mm, acceptance with that and you had mentioned about um you make mistakes all the time. And I think this kind of goes back to the, the jazz thing. I'm going to know you with that again, but the idea yeah. of being, the idea of being so good at something that you can make a mistake and slip up and not fall flat in your face. That is what impresses me about professional musicians like you or a jazz player, or even a professional skateboarder for that matter. Someone that could like make a mistake. Like you ever see a skater and they like, they're doing a trick and they fall, they're about to fall and somehow they just magically roll out of it. It's just like, to me, that's like, a really skilled musician, someone that can goof up, but then somehow, somehow it, it works. And that is something that um, the average person learning music or the average person, person learning painting, like for me, I can paint and go crazy and I could make a lot of mistakes, but I could, I could figure it out. You know, I can, even if I'm painting live on stage, I'll, I'll figure it out. I, I'm confident I will. And you're like that with music. And that's something that I, I wish I had. And, um, you recently also, I have to thank you, you kind of connected me with some resources for learning bass. And yesterday I had a breakthrough, which I've never had. Um, I was learning some scales, which I've I've always memorized the patterns, even on guitar, um, the pentatonic mm -hmm. patterns or major scale patterns. And it wasn't until yesterday, after all these decades, where I like put together something clicked where it was more about the spaces between the notes, you know, mm -hmm. tone, semitone thing. Um, yeah. and all, yeah. all of a sudden it was like, oh, for some reason it, it clicked more the way it was explained to me when I watched it on, on the video. Um, but I mm -hmm. think that's, I think those are sort of the concepts that people that are learning music or art or web three, um, they don't know how to recover from the mistakes in a way that, that gives them confidence. What do you think about Absolutely. that? In terms of mistakes, like, uh, again, it's, it's so wonderful, like learning and teaching music, I find as a teacher. I've I've gone got such a more appreciation for music and and have just been grown as a musician. I'd say one of the the top tips for that would be is the way that you practice. Um, one I thing I try to encourage my students is when they do make a mistake, try not to just stop and start again because when you're on stage, that's not really going to happen ever. You know, so you you know, and and you know they're learning their pieces or learning songs, and I mean. It's not as black and white as that. There's there's times where we will le like be learning specific sections of songs, etc. But in general, like if you're practicing the, a song as meant to be played as a song on stage, then you know carry on and 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 practice that ability to jump back in at the right spot and and work on your timing and work on you know it's all kind of go rolls into one really. But you're right. It's it's important to learn um, to be able to recover. And I tell you, I've had some monumental mistakes live on stage in front of thousands of people like 
like howling notes in the wrong thing and like i just you just have to roll with it and just like recover straight back in like it's unfortunate if it's recorded and you're like oh well everyone's gonna see that but whatever you know you know i it's kind of sometimes i like it sometimes it proves that you're human and not just a backing track and and uh you know some of the greatest music of all time is being created for mistakes you hear loads of uh, amazing stories of like james brown like um like telling mus- musicians on stage if they I don't, this is a complete paraphrase could be made up quote but um they you know they would they'd make a mistake and they would get fined at the end of the gig and then i think one time there was a he made a mistake and james Brown was like oh, do that mistake again and do it again do it again and then that's how what one of the one of the greatest riffs i can't even remember the song but um was was created so sometimes mistakes are you know a good thing yeah you yeah. know I- I've been um we've been watching that Beatles documentary over the past like week. Uh get back. Did mm-hmm. you see that? I've seen parts of it. I was on my like list. I've I've I, it was incredible seeing like it's just incredible. It's like the time going back in time. But um I was watching it with Emily and then she she had to go. So I've saved it to watch it the rest with her. It's unbelievable talking about like mistakes. It's like they're recording Let It Be, like bas- basically live. You're watching the process. And when you when you hear Paul uh, first of all, well, we, we have to get to this in a second. Paul's bass playing is a very strange technique. We'll get to that in a second. I want to understand want to understand that more. But before we get there, just it's interesting hearing them uh, start to play a song. So you know, as a fan, where it's going to end up. You know what it's like supposed mm-hmm. to sound like in air quotes. Um, but to hear all the iterations of how it got there is so cool. And those mm-hmm. sorts of things, like the humanity in it and the process is so magical. It's like, holy crap, how has this footage been sitting there for so long? Um, but that's the kind mm. of thing that scares me with AI. We're, we're approaching the, the Web3 topic here. But, um, mm. it, you know, that's the sort of thing that we're, you don't have with AI when it just spits out stuff. You're not having that magical, spiritual connection of of making mistakes and taking journeys in places that you won't end up. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do, do you think about that? So we'll approach the the uh, Web three topic. But do you think much about that? Like how it's how AI is is affecting the creative process or the journey of the musician and the artist and any of those things that I just talked about. What what kind of stirs up in your brain? AI is really interesting. I I have I I, I think at the moment to be completely honest, I feel like I'm on both sides of the fence, and that, Me too. Uh, that like. I, I don't know the answer. I don't know what's right and wrong. I, I, I love progression and innovation. I think this is coming. You, it's going to be hard to fight. I think so. I'm experimenting it with myself. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. learning new tools. I, of course, I do love the process. Like you said, I think, well, it's a theory, but maybe the process will become eventually if it's hard to tell the difference between art that's being created by humans and ai then maybe that the process of the creation itself will become more valuable than the final product um and there's a history behind the artists you know there's 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 legacy which will probably become more um and don't get me wrong there'll be famous ai artists but if 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 we do i mean it's a hard conversation like is the art is the final product what is you're buying is that actually it you know is that it or is there more is there more to it um so i think as a tool it's incredible though like my my fiance emily fay she's a singer songwriter she's um that's her job and we i said i set her a little task i said look here's ai can you just like try it with it you know and um so she typed into chat gbt and, and she said you know write me a song about this in the perspective of this and it just spat out a song like instantly yeah. and she was like wow that's like a crazy tool so it gave yeah. her the verse chorus everything and she, she's a guitar player as well so she's like can you put some chords to this boom there's a chord sequence there's a song like just like that and it's like wow that's unbelievable so then so then she like played along with that song and she's like eh, it's okay you know it's not bad like it's okay definitely it didn't write the melody line. So I know there's probably AI that does that for you, but there is something like she used it as a tool, like, and it was an interesting tool, but it didn't give her that number one hit. But then she used her experience and her 10,000 hours of songwriting to change it, phrase it, tell a story, and she made it into a better song. And then she used her, obviously, a unique voice and playing, and she recorded it. And it was a good song, you know? It wasn't one of her best, but it was a good song. So as a tool, it was quite amazing really she was able to to have a product there and then 
I think, yeah, I like AI. Personally, I love AI to, to do things that um, so that I can create more, as in I love it to answer my emails and, and answer, do all the admin boring stuff yeah. and, and get that out of the way. And so that I can fo- and market, for, help me market and help me, you know, as an artist, I'm sure you know, you have to be everything. You have to be a social media manager and marketer, Discord mod, you know, postal service, pack, like the list goes on. It's seven full-time jobs in, in a row. So I'd love AI to kind of take some of the stress off of that. Um, I think that's one thing that will be a good for artists. Um, and, but, you know, I've seen some pictures out there, which are like, I love that. I, I connected with it straight away. Oh, it's an AI artist. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I, again, it goes back to our previous topic. Like if you connect with it, does it matter how it's made? Again, if you're willing to buy and, and purchase it, who knows? Um, so there's, we could talk about that topic for ages. What I do think is quite interesting is I've been writing this document and this theory, and it's kind of what I'm I'm going in in terms of my web three music journey. Um, is is the way that you could maybe have a bridge? So this isn't slightly AI, but this is web three music, and it's how you could. The music industry is is been in trouble for a little while, you know, like songwriters, musicians, everyone. It's quite hard to get paid as a musician in general, logistically and actually getting paid. You know, you heard things like Spotify, you get whatever the stats are, 0.003 pence a, a, um, a stream. You know, it takes probably like, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing, but 300,000 streams to make a thousand pound a month or whatever, you know, which is so unachievable for most musicians. Like that's right. a lifetime of streams for the avenue. So just that alone, how are you even meant to survive as a musician? So this is where I think Web3 is really interesting and and it's where I'm kind of pushing and doing some things there and trying to innovate and and think of new ways that I think how could I, I in, in a general honest, I would like, how can I fix the music industry? This is how I would do it. I'm mean, just one person, but I'm, I'm think I'm trying to figure out new ways. And there's a concept I've been playing with and like, we can relate it to the Beatles, for example. And in a, in a nutshell is at the moment, artists release like one song, but I would, you know, in the in that studio floor, there's thousands of iterations and different drum fills and, and different focal phrasing and different lyrics. And this is all useful and interesting stuff. You know, this could be used in a Web3 way where essentially you're generating through your own recordings u- unique versions of an album or a single. You know, it's something that I'm we're currently releasing in a few weeks. It's my fiance Emily and I do a collaboration called Hundred Years of Women, and it's 100 songs. It's all different lyrics. There's a hundred different guitar solos, and it's and it's a really interesting process. So rather than just one song, it's a hundred. Um, and just to explore that further, imagine being able to have an album from the Beatles, but there's just that different way that you know John Lennon like sings this part, or you know, there's this bass fill that. Paul McCartney just does differently and you are the only one that owns that album you know like imagine if this technology was there back then you'd have a unique one of one Beatles album and now that the rarity of that would be unbelievable you can go further and add utility so you know in web3 utility is quite important it's, it's having um extra to the music or arts for example if you own this um album it gets you free concerts or it gets this so if you applied it to a Beatles record imagine owning a royalty utility where you get 0.01 percent of you know that beatles album like that, that that would be incredible now the reason why i'm saying it back then but this is the technology that's coming out now so in, in 56 years time then yeah i imagine that it's going to be a similar thing you'll have artists who are pioneering this web3 music mu- movement now which are going to be rare and collectible and there hopefully be a different way to release and consume music really with the idea that i'm kind of paraphrasing this whole document but the idea that music to fix the music industry i think it's going to head in towards focusing on communities rather than just you know rec- spending thousands recording a single releasing the single hopefully it blind blindly works or it gets on a tiktok video or you know or the record label promotes it and etc like everyone in the industry knows it can be very tricky but kind of as a band you develop a community around your music you release a limited amount of tokens or let's call them albums 
given to your community and if you're a new and upcoming band you could release them for you know a bit more than what you would usually cost for an album and this in a way you could sell them to your you know your most loyal fans they become your street team because they love you anyway so they you know share about your music and then what you can then do is add in a royalty and so they like actually financially benefit for you doing well as well and eventually you have like almost treating bands as you, you know fan, fans being able to invest in bands you know through buying their music and then what's so interesting is then you can kind of give them free tickets you can partner with brands and give them the brands thing straight there's like so many like I'm, i i can't go into this enough i would spend five hours on this podcast talking about it but the idea being able to save the music industry by making bands focus on their communities and, and giving more to their, their bands and actually if you did it this way they'd make more money than be able to get from their record label and then they don't have to pay all these crazy whatever percentage fees for 360 deals anymore but rather they give it to their fans you know i think this is a it's my ideal world scenario that could happen to the music industry and that's let alone all the logistical benefits from it you know if it's on the blockchain i would love this if i could flip a magic world wand and have all music for example on the blockchain so that you know instead of when you play when you play a piece of music in your pocket you know that instantly goes into a percentage of that goes into the um songwriter and goes to the manager and the producer and it goes to this and the band and it's just instantly and slowly everyone gets paid really all we want is musicians and creatives to just get paid fairly for what they create and that's that's the dream but a way that you could have if a radio played it boom that's your percentage straight in your wallet no years of <laughs> applying and lawyers fees and contracts and and like the nightmare logistical it is but yeah, hopefully I'm I'm kind of probably sounding like a crazy person to anyone who hasn't jumped into this Web3 world yet. But the mission that I would love to, I don't know, be a part of is is just helping creatives get paid fairly for what they do. I mean, I how many times I went to Nashville like a few years ago and I was speaking to some like top, top song writers and producers who make the big, big money. And they were saying like, you know, when they were, you know, some of these were fairly older than I in their 60s or 70s. And they were saying, you know, 30, 40 years ago, they could retire and of, of one song. And they were saying now they barely even make a few months kind of rent off the same level. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really interesting. It's so interesting. I could talk about this for hours. So hopefully I'm not boring the people listening, but I, um, I'm very passionate about it. I'm very passionate about uh, musicians and creatives just hopefully getting paid fairly for, for what they do. I mean, I'm very interested and passionate about this as well. It's, it's, um, it's a paradoxical set of emotions that I have because on the one hand, all the technology is extremely exciting. And as a human and as a person living in society, I'm excited to see where all this stuff takes us. Um, I have so many mixed emotions so and, th and feelings and, and thoughts. I feel like there's definitely a parallel that's going on with Web3 as far as, let's say, art is related. Because with music, uh, mid-90s, let's say, MP3s, dig digitization of the music distribution sort of took over and people were at a place where you're like, what am I going to do with MP3s? And I had a lot of nerdy friends going to tech schools at the time that were like sitting there with like big headphones, listening to their Dell computer music. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is not going anywhere. And a lot of people are having those sort of feelings right now with, with let's say as it pertains to art. And then the next, and then the iPod came out and you're like, Oh my God, it makes sense. I get it. I'm like wondering where that hardware interface is that's going to make all of this as far as visual assets go on the blockchain. I think there's going to be some sort of thing like that that makes sense of it all. And then I guess the next exit marker on this path is you had MP3s, then you had the iPod, then you bought MP3s. I, I remember a lot of my musician friends were selling like flash drives, thumb drives with their MP3s on it and then streaming. And I'm like, I feel like maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like there has to be some sort of streaming giant that comes in and says, hey, you have your new Apple iFrame that's hung up in your wall. 
you no longer have to buy your art on the blockchain. You can now spend $20 a month and we will stream all of these artists to you. And I feel like it's going to go full circle mm -hmm. where it's like artists will make money and we're going to own our assets. And then all of a sudden it's going to be like, mm -hmm. oh, great. I have to sell my art to whatever the art version of Spotify is. And I'm going to make pennies on what I was making lots of money before. I feel like um, it's just the way capitalism and the market and technology and innovation goes you know, artists and creative people pave the way in crappy neighborhoods and make it great. And then they get, they get outpriced and they have to move and it happens to technology. And I feel like that's inevitable that as much as we dream up these great ideas, eventually these corporate giants will come in and say, I'll find a way to make money on you and you and you and you, and you're going to make pennies and we're just going to stream it to their digital wall or whatever they have. It, how can that be stopped? Like, I don't know if it could be. It's so interesting. Um, I, I have so much to unpack there. I love, it's an interesting idea about the Spotify um, version of art on the wall. Um, yeah, very interesting. I have to think about that one. I can probably talk about the music side of things a bit more, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. When you can, when you were mentioning, you know, MP3s to streaming, at the moment streaming is you know spotify for example you just can't really beat it it's like i'm a musician and i love spotify in the sense that i have every song i could ever want in my pocket for what is it 15 quid a month it's like there's no beating that but you know i still go to my favorite bands and i still go on their website and i'll buy their merch for, in particular signed cds for example you know that's because i love them but at the same time it almost feels like there's also there's kind of this feeling it's almost like going above the extra mile to do that when it shouldn't be like that that shouldn't be the narrative it should just be you know that should be the way um i think what's interesting is the next step from so mp3 streaming nfts could be the way it's essentially a way of you know instead of buying that mp3 this is you can buy that mp3 in the form of an nft but you know essentially you could resell it it's kind of that an actual ownership because at the moment you're just buying an mp3 and you, you can't do anything with that mb3 but with nfts you actually have ownership over this physical digital sorry over this digital item so now you could um it could be just sim as simple as that you know itunes are now nfts and every song that you buy is um an nft and you own it but maybe adds utility for example you could use it on your youtube videos um or you could you know there's loads of different ideas and you know the youtube copyright is obviously a, a huge thing and that's but if it was all on the blockchain it's as simple as if you have this nft in your wallet you can use it and then you own the rights to use it as a youtube video maybe just for personal use but maybe if you're if you're a um a brand or a corporate you have to buy a um a brand or corporate version of that nft for example to use these huge songs and i mean there's loads of different ways this could go um you know adding it to for example radio um play um what if what if you know let's take a band like the chili peppers what if they release an nft and they said um it's 10 versions of their new single right or a new album whatever a new single and everyone is scrambling to listen to this new song right mm. so they said look anyone who owns this nft it's only 10 can can do what you know they have playing rights and then eventually you get all the radio stations around the world being the people fighting for this you know it doesn't have to be Shibu, ed sheeran beyonce anyone um they are now scrambling to purchase this nft because when they own it they get exclusive rights to play it on their radio show yeah and then it brings people back to radio now it's only being played on radio it's not being played anywhere else um you know there's loads of different kind of ways this could go in terms of art i'd say in that kind of aspect of having it on the wall um and then you pay ten dollars a month and you get all these artists you know that's interesting it will work for some i think art is a little different because i think then maybe your physical you might find your physical sales go much higher let's say if you're a featured artist on this you know thing then people are then because you know this i don't think physical art is going anywhere I still think even if digitalism, you know, is exploding, some people just love to touch and feel the paint and have that in their their house. So I don't think that's going anywhere. Um, this is just another avenue, I suppose. Um, but you could have in the NFT side of things, you could have, again, utilities, you could have special prints, you could have special 
only if, if, you know i know that you've done this yourself so if you own this nft you get the physical version of it and um, there's so many interesting ways of doing it also for example like storage i mean you could have um have you you for example you have 10 paintings in your house which you store and when they buy the nft they can buy and sell and this is rather than you know transporting that piece of art from country to country to country to country and having it damaged and everything it could just simply be sold as an nft and then when the person's ready to have the physical piece then boom they burn the nft and then they get sent that piece so it's almost like a an easier way to buy and sell pieces of art without having to you know lug and pay for shipping and risk it getting damaged there's loads of ways it could be used for the good for sure um yeah, yeah. so i think it's interesting times i'm going to be excited to see what people are doing in terms of what you were saying you know artists then eventually getting shafted and um you know being used by big corporations i mean in the music industry it's already happening like it's already happening in general so uh, i don't know if it can get much worse so at least we're i think we're in an upward tra tra trajectory with art um this is something that you could probably speak more about it on me but how would you feel like if this service came out you know where your art could then be but maybe it's just you could look at it as a different form of um, income. You know, I don't, will, will it affect, you'd have to experiment and see. So let's be in an imaginary world now. And mm -hmm. there's this Spotify version of art. So let's say it's fully mainstream. Everyone has it in their house. They have it for their TV or they have digital displays and everyone's got it. Everyone, it's, it's, it's as popular as Spotify. You know, would you be sad making some money per month of just of of you're not doing any extra work in a sense you're it's just being you know it's all, the content's already there and it's just pieces that you've already created and everyone that has maybe they have to choose to display your work but if a million people saw your work and you get 0, 0.0 thing maybe you're getting a few thousand dollars a month or even a few hundred i don't know what it would be in this magic world but a few hundred dollars a month and then you're having your arts streamed in is that a bad thing maybe i don't know maybe if it's if it's a bad thing if it stopped your physical sales and it stopped your, your sales but if it didn't and then it maybe brought more attention i don't know is that bad what's your thoughts yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i you know it's it's again it's one of those things that there's no right answer and it's also like we both said there's there's no stopping any of this shit so it's like does it really matter mm -hmm. but it's it's a fun mental experiment to talk about um is it bad i think for an artist it's potentially bad because mm -hmm. you're sort of losing control over, like for me for instance most of my income comes from selling physical art prints mm -hmm. originals what have you mm -hmm. and i think that if if people no longer needed that I think there's always going to be people that want the physical art. For me, there's no there's no uh, comparison. If you go to a museum and you mm -hmm. are able to see the brush strokes of a Van Gogh, there is zero comparison to having a print mm -hmm. of a Van Gogh. And I, I own a print of Van Gogh in my house because I clearly can't afford a real Van Gogh. So I see the value in wanting to uh, display art on a, on a flat two-dimensional surface like a print. Um, mm -hmm. There's no comparison to the real thing. But I also think like we, I think the standards are, are lowering at the same time that our generations are being educated to the value. Like, for instance, again, bringing up the Beatles and watching this documentary and like back then there was an art form to recording on multiple tracks. And the idea of getting effects, post post recording effects um uh, doing crazy things with tape or having the the recordings go backwards like there was all sorts of levels of creativity or with the effects of the guitar even like they were using physical objects at the recording thing they had a guy maxwell silver hammer with a guy with a hammer like stuff like that nowadays all of that stuff is just digitized and you could buy like a you know some sort of a logic pro plug-in for hammer sounds or whatever does that make the end product different no it still sounds like a hammer but there's some it, it's i think we're slowly pulling back the layers of magic and people uh, for instance like i take my kids to a museum they they appreciate art they love art but not in the same way that i did when i was a kid because i knew when i was a kid as an artist that each brush stroke had thought behind it you know why that color why that brush stroke why that medium they used 
what kind of effect were they trying to achieve? And like there was thought and intention in every step of a painting. Whereas now, especially with digital art, you could just change the levels and the curves and the hue and the saturation until you kind of like you can move, just move stuff around. And I do it. I do digital art. I do it. I, I benefit from it. So I'm not knocking it. Um, but there's a difference between just kind of move some scroll, you know, move some bars around until adjust this, adjust that, add this, add that, just, you know, undo, undo, ah, made a mistake, undo. There's a mm -hmm. difference between doing that and like physically being like, fuck, I have to do this painting section over because I messed it up or I want to change this color scheme. That's going to take me four weeks to to figure out, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't love that the magic of creativity is being lost or watered down. There's also nothing mm -hmm. we can do to stop it. Um, so I have so many mixed feelings on those things. I think that everyone eventually will have some sort of digital frame or a wall or hologram or whatever that we can't imagine. And at some point, we will be just streamed and we'll be – I don't like the, the commodization of art. Like it's it's weird mm -hmm. because with music, with Spotify, like – Everyone is so into music because everyone has access to everything. I was reading this amazing article I posted on my Twitter this morning. Um, this one reporter wrote about how we have more creativity being created, generated, and published in every medium than we ever have in the history of the world. But the straw from which we drink is now narrower, narrower and narrower. That's a hard word to say. Narrower. There you go. It's a very, it's a very slim funnel from which we're consuming all these things. Like we have maybe millions of songs a year that are being generated, but maybe only a couple of them get attention. So mm -hmm. is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. There's no stopping it. Some of it's a total bummer and it pisses me off. <laughs> The other part of it is like, you know, it's there's their tools and we have to accept them. So I don't know how to answer your question. It's it's a tough topic. So many things that I could go and yeah, chat about all that. It's interesting. I I mean, it seems like I mean, how does your music get out there in general? I mean, is it what's the success now? Is it being played on the radio? Is it being played on TikTok? If it is it going viral? I'd you know what is success now it's, it's a hard um thing to say as a musician what you were saying before is is that magic is i i find it interesting that even some of the younger students i teach you know teenagers they love vinyl and vinyl is is huge at the moment and i feel like it's interesting that vinyl is is huge where cds aren't super popular or mini disc players and and you know but vinyl massive um it's that interesting there's that something something about that analog sound you know that you can you can really feel like especially on the older records it does feel like a bit of magic it feels like you're kind of in the room um so yeah i agree on that in terms of creativity i don't know the answer to that i um i think it's hard to it's hard to do new things it's hard to be innovative it's hard to will there ever be another Beatles it's, it's hard because no one really did what they were doing you know will there be another Led Zeppelin as monumental as Led Zeppelin or you know all the artists before them like it's hard to do that so you're really always falling on, on the backs of these legends so I mean that's interesting it's interesting but you know there are still people doing new things and and i still find bands that i love and you know they definitely take ins you know inspiration from a lot of other older bands that i love but they're amazing um in yeah. terms of creativity I, I like them i like that they're actually being able to be made you know like i i don't think like i had to learn i don't have you know i don't come from a very rich family or so i've had to learn to do everything i've had to learn to record and produce my own demos and and do it myself and there's that kind of beauty in that, you know, they don't always sound as good as, as a million pound recording studio, but I made them and I'm very proud of them. And then when they do kind of reach a certain level, then yeah, I, I make money and I'll go record them at a fancy studio. Um, but the creative process is, it's, I like that you're able to have that creative process, you know? So it's, it's interesting. It's so, so many things I could talk about that on that subject. Yeah, I need to think yeah. some more. I was like going to say something and I completely forgot. <laughs> I had a great thought. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I love it. I love it. I find some of the, um, it's interesting when we, what, what kind of drew us together was the bands that we were into. And um, it seems like we, 
we were it it was just to talk a little bit like that i can't remember exactly how it came about but i think it was either one of us dm'd each other from something like yeah. i really can't remember i have to go back maybe it was i just so i saw your work and i just went boom instant connection i loved it i mean like you said i, I surf i love the, the everything about it like and i'm not just saying this out of all i was going for a, looking at different art every day in twitter and and it was a whole kind of boom of the nft world and yours was the first and and the biggest one i've connected with because of it just reminded me of everything i do surfing like music it was it how you know it was a kind of an instant so when i got speaking to you it was so you know what i don't even can't even explain it but like it was like it was almost guaranteed that you were into the same things as me because of how much I connected with your art, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, um, it was so, so strange. So, um, and maybe, yeah, surfing, maybe because it's all linked, a lot of surfers like the music we're into, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm still, I, I'm a, I'm a grommet in my eyes. I'll always be like, I, I have never um, like yeah. properly taken up surfing. I do it every, it's all the time, basically, like even in the winter in Jersey. Um, but obviously summer's a bit more busier surfing wise. But anyway, to go back to thing, we, we listen to similar music. So it was amazing to see like, oh, you know, oh, you met this guy here. Oh yeah, I've met, met this guy. Yeah, I've toured with this guy. Oh, you know, I've painted with this guy and I've done this. So that was kind of like an instant connection with me. So it's, yeah. it was easy to keep to keep um, chatting to you over the probably, I don't know, 18 months now it's been. Yeah, um, yeah I, I love it. Um, and you mentioned a few, um, a few like so. Some of the people that we have in common that we've met is um, John Butler, for example. I know that you. Um, I was on tour uh, with him. Yeah, there. yeah. That was uh, yeah, that's a that was a, a wild uh, experience. 2010. I had my first um, uh, opportunity to be featured in Brazil. I got um, mm -hmm. they paid to have me come down there. I featured my art in some art shows. It was I was on a tour, a traveling tour where it was like an art show before the music and my art was, was being featured before the musicians. And that was my second time doing it in 2010 was John Butler uh, was one of the musicians, which was just such a trippy experience. I have some great photos, which I can't publish. Um, he and I, and, and like maybe 10 other people packed in this compact car going to like night, mm -hmm. a nightclub run at like two, three, four in the morning, squished in the back of a car. And it just, uh, it was just a crazy couple of, uh, mm -hmm couple of days but um yeah that's that's wild you know like uh, i love that's one of the things i love about you know like our friendship that we're nurturing I, like i love the the like-minded connection that we share um i love the energy and the artwork you're you're creating and the reason i was kind of um putting those questions towards you is like you know i think abstract art definitely does have a connection to the music and and a lot of my paintings when you kind of zoom in you know, to them, there was a lot of ab abstract elements to my paintings, even the ones that are not abstract paintings. So I've always had a fascination and love with just abstract energy and forms. And I feel like you capture that well. And um, another thing I was going to say before I'll, I'll bring up, but I don't want to go on a tangent because it's like a hot topic, but we were talking about some of the uh, questions about making a living and, and all that. I'm like wondering with like AI and robotics and all these innovations, if it's going to get to the point where so many jobs are literally made, you know, to the point where they're not needed anymore, right? Like, it, it, yeah. it, is that going to push governments? And I'm not saying pro or against this. I don't want to hear pe from people. But is it going to push governments to the point where, like, they will have to sort of provide for people some kind of universal basic income or housing or some sort of social safety net? Because it's going to get to the point where, like, all driving jobs are no longer needed because every car drives itself. You know, potentially many creative jobs, just like architects. There was once a time when there was r rooms full of people with drafting tables and rulers and all that stuff were needed, and people uh, setting letters for book printing. All these things were are vanished. They're no longer around, right? And there's going to get to the point where between AI and robotics and all these different things, like a majority of jobs are going to be gone. And I wonder if it'll get to the point where we no longer have to do our craft and our passion for money. Like it would be a utopian, maybe not realistic, but it would be a utopian vision for all of us to get to make the music and the art just because we love to do it. 
and not because of the money and not because of the the hustle that's needed to drive our careers. I don't want to go down a political pathway at all <laughs> because these are mm-hmm. topics that have nothing to do with our expertise. But it it does beg the question, like with all these jobs being removed, I, I wonder what it would look like. Like we either fall mm-hmm. into an apocalyptic world where everyone's starving to death in the world mm-hmm. or somehow we're going to have to help each other. And I don't know what the right balance of those two is. It's really interesting. It's something I think about all the time. I, I, one of the reasons I guess I started as a musician, apart from the pure passion, is I never thought I'd be out of a job because I was like, you know, that's it. Everybody needs music. Everybody needs art. And then, yeah, seeing this year, I don't know how I feel if someone can just type in a few words and boom, it's a number one hit song right there. And then, you know, like I was chatting to someone who said, you know, you know, AI soon will be able to, maybe in our lifetimes, you know, everyone will have the is the tv shows that they watch they'll have specific tv shows tailored just for them with all their entrance in interests you know completely created on the whim from ai just like that boom here you go it's interesting like i don't even know the power of ai yet um so to answer your question i don't know um i'm like i'm a bit of a massive hippie at heart really um um i i definitely am open to my mind being changed but talking you know i listen to podcasts all the time again i won't go into the political side of things it left wing right wing i listen to both sides and and i probably yeah i i agree there's sometimes i hugely agree with left and then sometimes i can agree with some things on the right and go down the middle and everything totally. you know, i'm open yeah, that's open, healthy. open to it yeah super healthy yeah, i always listen to everything and, and and i'm very very like you know my mind can be changed all the time depending whoever i'm talking to in terms of um universal basic income and i just don't know really i um i would hope that you know it's always been the case with technology that people find new jobs you know you know when uh there's there's so many examples of like printing presses and and everything and and so many different examples where technology has made a lot of jobs obsolete um but they have found other jobs um so we would hope that there are other jobs out there or other things maybe they're more you know coding and technically um focused but you know hopefully those jobs are out there um so i i don't know i i also you know when you said about the grind and the hustle sometimes that's when the best art is made you know you like when you have to do it you have to struggle and you it's like your life literally depends on making this music or art or or, you know you see that in sports for example some of the best mma fighters are when they're struggling and they're you know there and then when they are successful and become famous and rich you know it's not their best fights anymore because they don't have that hunger so similar thing with with artists musicians maybe that's it's part of it um but but would i not you know especially 10 years ago would i have not loved to be um, a struggling artist yeah you know maybe uh it would have been easier to be able to focus not having what having financial worries and things and but i don't know is the answer in terms of if everyone's going to lose their jobs i, I you know I've, I've been watching the last of us um and i feel like i hope it doesn't get to a post-apocalyptic world with zombies and everyone running around and <laughs> fighting for fighting fighting for their lives and fighting for the scraps but um i think I'd like AI to take take out the jobs that people don't want to do. Um, that would be nice. Um, if if it's just that we just get to create art, and I, I mean, to be honest, I, I'm just rambling. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, the answer. No I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, there, there's absolutely no answer. I think the difference between this and other historical comparisons is like, for the first time ever in in human history, where we were replacing what it is to be a human like before you could find a new job because certain industries were kind of taken down but now it's like you can't really necessarily in the future you can't necessarily just find a new job because they can just have like a robot or a software or something do every job like i was trying to think the other day with a friend of mine i'm like what jobs are really really safe like like maybe certain things with healthcare or like more nurturing type stuff i would have said it like five years ago i would have said art creativity and art in general is something you couldn't replace but now you can it's uh it's exciting and scary because i feel like a lot of world human problems are going to be solved at an exponential rate um, which is exciting 
but it's also mm-hmm. going to be really weird and interesting to see. Um, what mm-hmm. have I'm going to have to wrap up in a bit because I have my three kids upstairs and it's a weekend. But yeah. uh, I would like to know, are there things, topics, projects, anything that we didn't touch upon that you would like to touch upon? I know we talked a little bit about your um, your project with Emily. We talked about uh, some of the music stuff going on. I guess what's coming up? What other topics would you like to open the door to before we wrap up? Oh, it's been so great chatting. Um, honestly, it's been amazing. Um, I'm if anyone wanted to ch- check out my work, I'm I'm bstract underscore art on Twitter. Um, my DMs are open, I believe, so feel free to just drop and say hello and, and mention the podcast so I know that you um, where you came from. Um, I would say in terms of my art, what's what's exciting now is I really have feel like I'm finding my style in terms of my visual arts. I, you know, it's it was very abstract, but now, you know, through a lot of practicing and, and learning and, and developing, I've found this style, which I love, which is almost animated with my music. And it's it takes all my 10 years of music experience. And, and sometimes I'll write a song and then I'll try and animate and, and create a piece of visual moving art to this music and it kind of creates a mixed media piece and that's where i feel like my unique style will be known i feel like it's hard to kind of make a name for yourself as an abstract artist because one of the things that that you know is so great with your art is that as soon as anyone showed me a piece that looked similar to yours i'd say that's i know who that's from and that's i think what makes artists stand out is being able to pick them out from a lineup and i feel like that can be a little bit hard with some abstract art um it's hard. It's very hard to get a unique style, but with the new style I've been working on for a, a year, two, two, you know, a year and eighteen months or so, I feel like this is the style that I will be. If I'm ever known for my art, this will be the style that I'm known for. So this is the the stuff that I'll be le- releasing this year. Um, I'm very lucky that it's been selected uh, NFT NYC to to be displayed there at Times Square um, and a few other places around the city. And yeah, this kind of style, you'll see it slowly coming out. I had my first piece on super rare with it. Um, so yeah, if you just keep an eye out for that style, I would love to know people's thoughts. Um, it's got music involved. It's got everything. And, and um, I'm really proud of it. I love the uh, seeing your style evolve. I really do. Like I liked it at the beginning. Just um, we talked about abstract art enough, but like I feel like it, it it does have an energy to it, and like I like how you manipulate the images. Um, there's there is a flow and a composition that that I can see the musical hardwiring uh, having an impact on that. And I, I really love how you've added the animation stuff. I really got to tell you that. Like it's a uh, it's it's unique and it really does have a voice. Um, whereas I could I could see what you're saying, like just purely abstract stuff could kind of blend in with other people. But what you're doing now is definitely more you and it's fun to watch. It's cool to see. And even though we're not living in a time where we are, you know, hanging out in a, in a coffee shop with John Lennon, I think people like us are trying the best we can to navigate our time period as pioneers, as the best we can, Exper- we're experimenting, we're hustling, we're doing what we can do, and we're trying to connect with uh, good people, we're trying to connect with nature and our art and our craft, and uh, I think that is something that I really appreciate in having like a friend like you, and it's something that I try to keep reminding myself is like still a noble pursuit. I keep reminding myself daily that what I'm doing matters. Because it is sometimes easy to forget that what you're doing actually matters in the in the noise of society right now. Um, so I would definitely encourage people listening to put out your work, let it evolve in front of people, make mistakes like we talked about. Um, and those sort of things that we touched upon are things that are in the forefront of our minds. And I hope that people listening can sort of relate to that in a way that helps them on their journeys. Absolutely. I can't, I can't completely agree more. Um, hundred percent. I think the, the art that is in this web three movement is, is very interesting as well. And I think if this blockchain technology is around forever, if, you know, if AI is there and technology keeps growing and growing, and this is the start of something huge, maybe just keeping an eye on it. If you've never looked at it before researching, I know like I won't go into a web three tangent, be very, very careful, be very, research security aspects never spend more money on things that you can't afford 
um you know there's there's so much to research and do so don't just just jump in and you know get involved in scams and things because there obviously are they're out there but in a, in a if you are interested in a plain and simple there's art there's music that have been put onto this web3 blockchain that you know is potentially could be the first in of its kind and and in, as a historical point of view mm -hmm. if, if you just treat it as a, as a ledger an online digital ledger you know this is going to be kind of day one and in 100 years time 200 years time if this blockchain is still around or in some form people are going to look back at this now as a as a movement yeah. absolutely good points well jay man i appreciate you jumping on this podcast so last minute it was really fun no and worries. Uh, hopefully I the hope... dog wasn't going crazy i'm going to take over. <laughs> i didn't hear your dog <laughs> I didn't oh, hear good, good, good. No, it was good. I um I hope our paths can overlap like when I'm in London and I'm bummed that you're gonna be within an hour of my house for NFT NYC. I have my work being on uh, <laughs> being featured as well, and I really would love to uh to to be I there to, uh, celebrating those those moments. But um hopefully we'll catch up in London and yeah, uh, just thanks so much, man. Oh man, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. All right, brother. All right, I'm gonna hit stop. That was awesome, man. Thank you. That was I could have talked forever. I just have to uh, be a good dad today. I could have not, talked, not hide my basement the I whole could, day. <laughs> I could talk. I could honestly talk to you for hours. It, oh, it was so so good talking to you. Hopefully, yeah, I wasn't I rambling it. on loads of. But no, but, um, I love these yeah, topics. I felt, man. Oh, it was so so natural, man. Like I, I honestly, I, I felt like I, I could chat with you and sit down for all day. <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't think this uh, fit on the podcast because I talked enough about my uh, my novice base uh, journey. But w can you briefly, like, for like a couple seconds, tell me what is going on with Paul McCartney's bass playing? He was like just strumming it. It looked like almost like with a pick or something. He wasn't. I didn't see him once in the entire documentary actually like plucking or slapping or anything. He was just like strumming. Is that what's going on with that? I'd have to check the video. I I I always thought that he was from the tone of his bass. Maybe he's playing with his thumb. I do you know the, the honest answer is I'd need to look at the video and, and okay. analyze it okay. a bit, bit more. But um, yeah, he's got his Hoffner bass. Um, I know that they. I feel like he uses his thumb. Like a lot of, it doesn't sound like a of, pick. He in was the doing this and, and like it, he was either either holding a pick or just strumming it with his thumb. But he was like, maybe, it was very odd. I was like, what is going on here? He was just Maybe playing it like a guitar. Um, I need to analyze this. So he's such an underrated bass player. He's incredible. And this, you know, like he's, oh, he's probably genius. the most famous. Fa oh, genius. And he's probably, people don't even realize, but he's probably the most famous bass player in the world. Yeah. Like, even sound. though the people don't, they don't even sometimes equate him as a bass player. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's, ah, oh, some of the, his lines are just beautiful. Like mm. I've like, I've had the pleasure of teaching some of them to students and, and like, oh, and I just finish it and be like, oh God, this is amazing. So the answer is, I don't know what's, what's going on. Yeah, it's a lot of them. I've always thought sounded quite bass heavy. There's not always that attack, but I, I could be talking nonsense. Yeah. Well, dude, enjoy the rest of your weekend, bro. I uh, can't wait to see you in person and meet, meet Emily as well. And uh, it's going to be fun. Definitely so right. fun yeah talk soon Definitely. brother take it easy man all right See man later later